World building is complicated, especially when we start to cram any and every detail that we can think of. We can easily get carried away with the amount of stuff that we're thinking of, but it's important to take a step back and add things slowly but surely. For the sake of simplicity and having a series title, I've divided my process into three parts, discussing what makes each important, some examples, and common mistakes that you might commit with each one. If you want to skip, timestamps are available. And remember, all of this is subjective. It isn't a tutorial on how to do specific things. It's more of a design checklist. But with that out of the way, let's start with... Afflatus and abode are just fancy words meaning inspiration and home. These are common starting points of any creature and other similar world-building details, like people. Starting with inspiration. This will dictate the design of the creature. It'll give it a central theme and relay unspoken information to your audience. There are many things that your creature can be inspired by. Real-life animals, weapons, myths, plants. But don't limit yourself to visual inspirations. Bodily functions, sounds, Movements, and even words are great sources of inspiration to mix with a creature to make it interesting. Take for example, an airplane. How would you design a creature from this? Would you turn the plane itself into a creature? Maybe an animal of living steel and wired nerves, like in Horizon? Or would you take inspiration from its wings, giving its ailerons to a creature and making it much more agile, like a Legiana from Monster Hunter? How you combine or implement these inspirations will allow your creature to stand out in a sea of similar designs. And there is no limit what your creatures can be based on or how many things you can base them on. Just don't mix too much or else no one will be able to tell what it is. Next up, habitat. Consider where your animal lives. Is it hot? Is it cold? Is it underwater? A habitat will influence your creature's traits and give it a space to feel alive rather than being a blob in an empty void. It also sets limitations both visually and biologically to be in line with its respective region. An example of a visual limitation would be marine animals having a specific counter shade where they're darker on top and lighter on bottom to help them camouflage their environments much easier. And a biological limitation would be they wouldn't have the same amount of dexterity that we have since they require fins for mobility making a creature much more believable. Compare that to designing a creature that looks cool, but dropping it somewhere it can't survive. Like a polar bear in a desert. When starting out, it's better to pick an environment rather than creating your own. It's tempting to forge a habitat from scratch, especially since this will make a creature much more unique than it already was. But if you don't know what you're doing, then this is a huge setback. Plus, extremely unique habitats already exist in nature. So don't overcomplicate things and start simple. Now, this is where it gets a tad technical, taking elements from real life and mixing them with your inspirations. Studying real life animals to incorporate their adaptations seems tedious, maybe even boring, but this is an important step to give your audience a tether to reality. Not that it's important to make every design realistic, where's the fun in that? It's more to let your audience easily connect your creature to an animal that they know. It gives them expectations of what it can do or how they're supposed to feel about it. A large puffy neck full of spines? Looks like a puffer fish. It might be poisonous. Big mole like claws? This must be able to dig really fast. Crab? Crab. <laughs> Crab. There's no need to go in depth when just starting, especially if you have no prior knowledge of animal anatomy or if your world is a little more fantastic. Musculature and skeletons aren't really necessary unless your world dictates or your lore or your story. Take note of common body plans and prominent structures to give your creatures a sense of believability no matter how outlandish. Even the most fantastic of monsters will draw inspiration from reality. Though behavior is technically part of a creature's biology, I've separated them to better explain it. Your creature's behavior would be how it would interact and react to things. Would they greet intruders with a series of aggressive clicks and hisses, or would they rather disappear to the safety of their nests? 
Do they have special interactions with the weather or other animals in the region? A specific diet that makes them behave in specific ways? These little things will influence how your world's inhabitants would see them and can lead to some interesting mythology. An example is how stag beetles are associated with thunder and rain, since they are much more abundant during storms. But the actual reason that they're more abundant during storms is that they can't fly due to strong winds. Another is salamanders being associated with fire. This connection was from early humans using rotting wood as fuel. The salamander inside senses the temperature rise and leaves giving the illusion that salamanders came from fire. Character is where you add personality to your creature. They aren't just mindless plot points or item guardians. Your creatures are characters, and each character has a unique personality. Are your creatures mischievous and play tricks on your character or other animals? Are they perhaps incredibly curious, meeting any foreign entity with caution and intrigue? Or maybe they just vibe with everything and everyone. But since most creatures don't talk or aren't sapient, the best way to add personality is through their body language, their sounds, and maybe even background music. Finally, we compile all of these during the conceptualization. Now, before you start, remember that the silhouette of your creature is extremely important. It says everything the audience needs to know from only a glance. And a unique silhouette makes your design iconic and easily recognizable. So be sure to emphasize certain parts and study shape language. If you don't know what shape language is, it's a way to communicate meaning by using simple shapes as the basis of your design. Triangle is for sharp, dangerous, and unpredictable things. Squares are strong, sturdy, and reliable. Finally, circle is soft, harmless, and approachable. Though this is the last part, this isn't the end of the process. Time and time again, you'll go back to the previous details to change your reference, add new adaptations, get rid of old ones, and so on. Never just stop at one concept. Try out every possible idea that comes to mind. Because as time goes on, you'll either think of better concepts or lose the initial feeling of your design. So don't be afraid or ashamed to go back and redesign. Not every creature comes out perfect the first time around, but that's the fun thing about designing. Before I demonstrate my process, I want to talk about a few pitfalls that beginners are susceptible to. Or maybe they're just my mistakes, but who knows. The first one would be shrink wrapping. This is where we draw the animal so thinly that you can see where its muscles begin and end while having absolutely no muscle mass at all. You can also see bones jutting out, joints and spines that are extremely pronounced, and the skull having so much detail because it's basically just bone. This makes your creature look extremely malnourished and more like a skeleton rather than a live specimen. This leads us to our second problem, making a creature have too much muscle. I understand that we want our creatures to look strong, but you can't have something that looks like it goes to the gym every single day. There are plenty of ways to make a creature look strong, one of it being shape language. And this is all without making each of its muscle fibers made from steel. Now, the third is having too much going on. Too much colors, too much patterns, too much spikes especially. Not everything needs to glow, not everything needs to control elements or have defenses all over its body. Sometimes, the best designs are the simplest ones. Fourth, having absolutely no diversity. By this, I mean we limit ourselves to either a single class or depict our creatures in a single style. Some of us draw too much mammals, some of us draw too much dragons, and then we draw them in a specific way, either being too cool, too cute, or too menacing. This drains out the uniqueness of your creatures and makes your world feel less alive. If you have diverse body plans and creature types, this makes your world much more interesting as they would interact in different ways, not only with themselves, but also their environment. You can't just have an entire world filled with dragons, unless you can, like these worlds. So if you can or want to, then go ahead. And last but not the least, Thinking that you need to think of everything yourself or think of everything right off the bat. You don't need to add every single detail of a creature. You also don't need to go through it alone. If you have some friends that are way better at designing creatures or they have experience in world building, maybe they have better ideas than you. Plus, having someone else's ideas and receiving help in your own works not only lightens your workload, but it's also really fun.
I know I call them mistakes, but they don't necessarily need to be seen as mistakes. They can be a specific style. And styles are only impactful if they're spread out evenly. If every one of your creatures look malnourished, it's not gonna look that terrifying. It's gonna be seen as how this specific world works. But if only one of your creatures looks like it's starving to death, it'll be much more impactful not only to you, but to your audience. Alright, I spent too much time rambling. Time to show you how I actually implemented this process, starting with inspiration. Back when I was hunting in Iceborne, two monsters caught my eye, Nergakuga and Leshy. All the pseudo-wyverns were interesting, but Nergakuga had that seamless implementation of design elements that made it stand out to me. It's a ninja panther that has swords for wings, a kunai launching tail, and an anime eye trail when it gets mad. What isn't there to like? Leshy was an interesting monster because it wasn't as scientific as the others that I've hunted. It's an in-game representation of the actual Leshy myth in Slavic folklore. Its incorporation into my design was mainly visual, but it'll change later on, you'll see. Habitat was easy. I hunted both in the ancient forest, so it's obvious that I'd use a forest, but I didn't want to outright copy the habitat of the Nergakuga, so I used a coniferous forest rather than a regular rainforest. Moving on to biology, this is going to be a wild ride, so buckle up. When adding in the biology, it's best to think of them like in-game mechanics. What are its strong points, weak spots, behavioral exploits, obtainable items, etc. This makes your creature easy to scale with your characters, allow you to properly plot out progression in your story or game, and for you to be able to easily connect them to a culture or a religion. Again, I didn't want the creature to be exactly the same as the inspirations, so I incorporated an amphitheater body plan and how flying snakes flatten their rib cages into how my creature traverses the forest. Next up, I wanted to incorporate the bark armor of the Leshy without making it use actual tree bark as armor or having scales that look like tree bark. So taking more inspiration from Monster Hunter, I looked towards an unlikely contender, Rakidios. On the surface, it's a giant armored T-Rex with explosive punches. That's not what I was after. I was more interested in its tongue. I mean saliva. I mean explosions. Its explosions are a result of its saliva catalyzing slime mold on its shell. So I decided to use the same tactic. My creature would be covered in mucus that would catalyze when licked into a tough scale to act as armor, camouflage, and help it retain moisture. They would constantly reapply this armor as they lick their skin like a cat, form them in layers. The scales would start off as a soft, translucent orange crystal shard, but over time it would harden, darken, and accumulate debris to make it look much more bark-like. And because of the layering method they do to form their armor, similar to a tree ring, you can tell the age of the creature from its scale, since different ages carry different weights. The veneer would act similarly to a fish scale gecko's defense, where they would tear their skin off when in danger for a quick getaway. The veneer is also what I ended up calling this special scale because this. This is also when I decided to mix in the Leshy inspiration. The scales are like fertilizer, so wherever the creature goes, the plant life below is lush and abundant. But its biology couldn't be all strengths, now can it? We need to add some weaknesses. Not only does this veneer look like tree bark, it acts like a tooth, getting softer when too much water is present, and it would burst into flames when ignited. Connecting directly to behavior, its flammable scales make it fear light, so it instinctually avoids human settlements because of this. And with the way its entire design screamed ambush predator, it would be extremely sneaky. A loud roar would just give away its position, so I limited my creature to clicks and hisses, mostly taking inspiration from gecko noises. Character. This particular beast is crafty and calculating. Sneak attacks are not easy to pull off after all, and that stems into its personality, occasionally playing tricks and setting up traps for no reason other than it's funny to see things stumble around. Then after all of that, I just plopped on a skull helmet, antlers, and said it was for sexual selection without thinking of it that much. The basic idea was for the mates to be able to tell how skillful an individual was as a hunter with what kind of skull they wore, but that reasoning didn't really hold up. So that's basically all the inspirations lined out in my process, but what I like to do is to filter it out even further like this. But this process might need a new video all to itself. So using all of those details that I just mentioned, I started conceptualizing and what I came up with was this. It sucks. First off, the name is just bad. Leshy mixed with resin, very creative. The wood doesn't even look like it's on the thing. It looks like it replaced its muscles. The wings don't look very capable of anything and the skull is a perfect fit for its head and I didn't know how to explain that. 
someone on a server pointed out that it's too thick to fly. I initially thought of this thing being like a giant python coiling its body to spring from tree to tree and swoop down to constrict large prey. A thick tail and a thagomizer would really hamper its flying ability. And three tongues? This design could work in some places if it was adjusted a bit, but I'm a dumb perfectionist, so I redrew the entire thing instead just for this video. And yeah, this looks a lot better. Its habitat became a custom forest I created specifically for it. Its wings allow for powered flight rather than just gliding. Prey preference also switched from rhino-sized animals to bite-sized ones like monkeys. The armor is also better, breaking out in areas that move a lot like the armpits and the elbows, and clumping together when the body is bent like in the neck area here. The helmet this time around isn't just a skull too. It's fragments of skulls and bones that are joined together by their veneer. Since they wouldn't be able to lick their faces that well, they have to compensate by wearing a skull helmet. Skull ornaments vary among individuals with different traits that benefit them. Some attach large ornaments like antlers or horns to show how strong they are in hunting and carrying the accessory. Some rely on the vibrancy of the glue that holds their ornaments together to show how durable their veneer is, while some steal fragments to increase their chances in mating instead of making their own skulls. Little details like these seem daunting at first, but I assure you that once you get that ball rolling, it's very easy to spiral into more and more ideas. If you've made it to the end of the video, thank you so much. This video took a while to make, but it was a really fun process through and through. It doesn't matter if you follow this video or if you disagree with everything I just said. There are a bunch of different methods out there, and I'd like to hear some of yours in the comments if you have any. But there is one universal rule when we want to make anything, and that's to start. So if you don't like my views on how to create a creature, that's alright. I at least hope that I inspired you to get started. Before I go, here are some YouTube channels I recommend that you watch. These ones for fantasy, biology, and ecology. These ones for real-world scientific inspiration and adaptations. And this one for thematic elements that you can use for your creatures. With that said, my name is Sketchy. Subscribe, and enjoy some bloopers on your way out. World building is complicated. Bad, bad, bad. And give it a space to feel alive, rather than being a blob in it. Oh my gosh, beaming. Like a pearl, like a polar bear, like a polar bear in the desert. Oh my god. <laughs> now, studying real life animals to incorporate their shrink wrapping. Shrimp, shrimp. I'd like to talk about a few fitfall, fitfalls, pitfalls. I'd like to talk about a few, few. I want to talk about a few again. I want to talk about a. <laughs> pitfalls that beginners are susceptible